Hey kitty cats, I'm Danny. I am the founder and creative director of Womankind Creative and today I'm your hostess of Gender Identity Weekly and we have Amethyst Herrick with us and we're turning things around on her. How are you doing today? I could be doing a lot worse. How about you? I'm doing good. I think we're rocking and rolling. So, so before far. we get fully started, I'll say this content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you're already a subscriber, thank you. Otherwise, please subscribe so that we can continue making content like this. It'll be directly sent to your inboxes when it's published, and you can interact with all the contributors directly. So if you'd like to support, if you'd like to support the show like this one, as well as the podcast, videos, and articles that are written by Ami, then go ahead and subscribe in the show notes. All right. I think I kind of killed that a little. <laughs> no, I think it was great. We can do it again if you want. But <laughs> What do you think? What would you rate that out of a 10? You know, I think you got a good, a solid seven. Okay. Okay, cool. I'll take that seven. Amazing. <laughs> Um, awesome. Okay. Well, Ami, I'm so excited for us to chat today. We have had conversation after conversation, and I always feel like we are connecting across themes that, you know, for Womankind Creative, where we're seeking representation for all women, really hit home. And I just want to continue to bring so much more awareness and leverage your expertise, your lived experiences to continue to have conversations that I think are going to help people broaden their understanding um, of what is a transgender woman's lived experience i'm all over it let's do it (laughs) let's do it okay so um for those that haven't heard our previous content i and you know especially on womankind creative i would love people to get to know you a little bit better so could you share your personal experience you know sort of like your discovery or coming into wanting to start the transgender process oh sure oh gosh that ends up being a long question um (laughs) Because some of this goes way back. I mean, when I grew up, you know, I grew up with three sisters and my father was not very present. So I had this really big feminine influence in my life. Mm. And much of what I learned, <clears throat> this will actually be an inter- this could be an interesting topic later on, but much of what I learned about, you know, the world outside my house came through like Vogue and Cosmopolitan. Mm. Um, what were the other ones? I guess Glamour we had things like that. But it was like fashion magazines. The things I learned were, you know, fashion and makeup and and boys. So (laughs) these were the things I just learned. And and I would go to school and I kind of go, I don't know what the hell these people are talking about. And then go back home and I was comfortable. And for the longest time, I just figured I was feminine. And then, uh, or, you know, really, I should say female, you know, I just assumed I was female. And then when when puberty set in, you know, the, the, the sad truth thunked home. That was a bummer. But that was kind of kind of where I realized, OK, someday it was also around this time. And I keep telling this story and I wish I could find the like the actual joke. But somebody made a joke about a Swedish vacation. Mm-hmm. And I guess. At the time, it would have been probably early 80s, maybe Sweden had just perfected some gender-affirming care, gender-affirming okay. surgery. I don't know, but I know I heard the joke about somebody flying to Sweden, a man, and flying back from Sweden, a woman. And I remember being like 12 or something like that, and I'm like, oh, that's all I got to do. Let's just go get a, <laughs> just like a ticket to Sweden, right? That shouldn't be a big deal. Plus, if I'm 12, they'll probably let me on the plane. Shouldn't be a big deal. So this is all, I mean, (laughs) this was sort of my introduction, you know, to life, to being, I guess, to being a woman, ultimately. But then I lived 40 years in between when I thought, okay, I've got to transition to when I actually did it. Now, somewhere in there, I mean, I started, somewhere in there, I was you know, dressing in women's clothing, using makeup. I I was part of the gothic community, Mm -hmm. and so makeup was great, right? I used to wear makeup quite a bit. And it was, everything seemed okay. I do remember the last time you and I talked, we turned off the the recording, and and, uh, gosh, we were talking about Victoria's Secret. I remember that much. 
And so more recently, so now here I am, I'm going to be 54 tomorrow, actually, believe it or oh not. Oh my goodness. Happy and early birthday. We have to stop and acknowledge that. <laughs> You're just going <laughs> to <right> get through it. <laughs> right. You know, what's funny is this probably isn't going to publish for two weeks, but, you know, oh. there'll be people going, oh, I missed it. <laughs> both of those people will, both of the people who listen will say, oh, I missed it. But So <laughs> where is that going? Okay, so I'll be 54. I transitioned a couple of years ago, and I used to be, I fit into all kinds of clothing. I don't know if I was just thinner. I don't know what it was, but... All of a sudden, like I could find no clothes whatsoever. And it seemed easier, you know, in 1994. Granted, when I'm 24, maybe it was just a different time for my body. Mm -hmm. But I'm certainly now looking at clothes and going, wow, none of this works. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too. And, and this is a little bit of an aside, but one of the major like transgender experiences, people go, OK, everybody, I'm coming out. I am transgender. I'm transitioning. Everybody, I want to use she, her pronouns. I want to be thought of as a woman. And then we go, oh, crap. Now I got to get like clothes and I got to get makeup. How do I learn how to do these things? Mm. And, and that's a really common experience. People going, I don't even know where to go. I can't go to the store because nothing fits me. So the first thing we learn is that despite the fact that we believe we are unequivocally women, we are proven wrong with every store we go to because clothes don't fit us exactly right, you know. Mm. How about if I stopped there? What? <laughs> no, so much is coming up. I mean, I, I think that's a beautiful segue in the, into the conversation that we're going to have today with regards to, you know, representation of transgender women in marketing and advertising, but also in the products and what is shown in retail and also then how you internalize that and how that affects your uh, concept of self. So I think that's a beautiful yeah. segue. Uh, but before we move on, I think something that I heard that I think is so important to emphasize is when the concept of gender or imposed gender identity by society became more cemented in your mind, because that was like a really big aha moment for you and, and the story there is that it was intrinsic and clear to you that you were female before the concept of gender existed and then you oh, were yeah. met with a um uh like a reality that didn't match what you was clear to you on the inside and I think it's just important to sort of like highlight that because I if, you know, I sometimes sense that from like the, the cisgender community or like some pe people who just don't understand and can't wrap their heads around it, it feels like it's like a decision rather than it's yes. like a knowing. And I think that that's such an important thing to just acknowledge is that like it is something that is intrinsically true to you. It wasn't a choice. This is right. This is you. It, it really was. I actually have a, a great example of this. <clears throat> Apparently today I'm going to be clearing my throat all day, too. <laughs> um, this past holiday, so my, my parents-in-law are Catholic, very conservative, and believe mm. it or not, they've, been all, they've also been very, very accepting of me. Mm. I'm saying believe it or not. I'm sorry, parents-in-law. parents, parents -in -law, If you're listening to this, thank you so much for, for, you know, for accepting me. I have actually been sort of surprised. But part of what... Part of what our relationship has sort of turned into is me teaching them a little bit about what all of this is. So during the holiday, which was remarkably sedate, very accepting feeling, I was talking with my mother-in-law. We were actually making a cup of coffee. <laughs> and she is Hungarian. And, and the, uh, there are no gendered pronouns in Hungarian. Everything is it. You are in it, I'm in it, this water bottle, it. And you figure it out from context whether or not the subject is gendered. And, and if so, you know, how? But, it, but it's a, it's a, a very non-gendered language. In fact, I think agender is maybe the better, even the better way to put it. So I bring this up because she was saying to me, she said, you know, there, there are still times she struggled with 
gendered pronouns the whole time I've known her. It's been 24 mm-hmm. years. I've known here, known her, and uh, sometimes she will talk about a person and the pronoun switch, sometimes multiple times in a sentence, because it's still not totally, like, in her head that the pronouns should be gendered. Mm-hmm. And so she said to me, listen, there may be times that I'm going to refer to you as he, and you're just going to have to, you know, let it go because, because, you know, I still have struggle with gendered pronouns. And I said, you know, I mean, I've known you a long time, and there are times you would refer to me as she that I kind of went, and she went, no, it's not like you knew that back then. And I was like, wait, what? And I went, oh, you do think this was a, like a, a recent onset, you know, bout of gender and dysphoria to rephrase, you know, the rapid onset gender dysphoria. But, and I said, we need to have a conversation. Cause I, I mean, you know, this story goes back to when I was at least four years old that I, I just assumed I was the same as my sisters and you can go, well, you were four and you were dumb, you know, not just, not just young, but young and dumb. And it's like, well, no, because it's never really changed. You know, it, it's always been, I've always felt myself to be feminine and, and not, and struggled to, to, to give off masculine, I think I'll just say masculinity. So, mm-hmm. but I think an interesting, you know, if I were going to turn this into the topic we were going to talk about, it's interesting how so many, how my experience has been identical to many of the women that that you you know for whom you you have this whole well, I'm trying to figure out how to say this like the reason we care about representation the reason we care about marketing that is inclusive is because almost every human on the planet struggles to to match social expectations mm. oof let's let that sink in. My God. Yes. I mean, yes, that's how we began our whole, I think like relationship and, and speaking with one yes. another. When, you know, I was telling you, you know, as like a Latina, I'm a very hairy woman. And so like, there was so much like, it, you know, you're the one who are like, that's like a, you know, gender dysphoria of feeling like that I should be like a seal yeah. without any, you know, hair. And if I didn't, then what did that, what did that mean? for me as a woman, like that, that was less womanly. Right. I had hair like a man. And I recently right. actually saw a campaign and I loved it. And it's like, you have hair like a human. And we may have talked about that in our last right. you know, conversation, but it is so true. We, we have put things in boxes as society. And then the rest of us are struggling to uphold these ideals on both sides of the equation, male and female, um, and right. everything and everyone in between. Right. Um, and so it's just, I think that's such a beautiful way to put it is that it all stems from all of us struggling to uphold these ideals because none of us, perfectly right. do. They're, right. they're unrealistic. Wow. And, and I think I, I love even more that like you could talk to, I'm trying to remember who it was. I, I was not Claudia Schiffer. There was, there was a model during the 80s, and my favorite was Claudia Schiffer. That's why I thought she I'd was. even throw her name out there. Mm-hmm. She was awesome. Loved her. But it's always the bright red lipstick. Oh, my gosh. Loved it. So, but there was some model during the 1980s. Somebody said, wow, you know, what does it feel like being this supermodel sex symbol? And she went, you know, I, I kind of have a big butt. And, you know, like my thighs are kind of cottage cheesy you know i mean i don't know do i really meet up to the the supermodel you know stereotype and i kind of want to say it was like cindy crawford kind of Mm -hmm. it was like a big one like somebody that you were like well jesus how are you doubting yourself yeah you were defining these social expectations how could you doubt that you meet that even you Meet the social expectations you were creating. And, and I, you know, at the time, I don't think I put that level of thought into it. But I know I went, oh, God, if she's if she's ugly, There's no for what the, the flying us. hell am I? Right. I'm like, God, I can't yeah. even put on lipstick right. And you're, you know, <sighs> you're concerned about you're concerned about the skin on your thighs. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and miles and miles to go. So. No, I love that. That's the end of my story. (laughs) 
giant scene. Um, no, I, I, right. <laughs> um, I love that. And that's so true. And I, and I, uh, the more that I feel like you have conversations, it's when we strip away these labels and these like societally defined boundaries um, that other one another, we find that the commonalities of our lived experiences are so uniting and actually the same, 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 but different, different flavors yeah. of the same aching and longing for belonging and acceptance across right. the board. Um, right. Wow. Amazing. What a beautiful foundation for this. So, okay. So you did touch upon, you know, going into Victoria's Secret. That was like such a, like a revelation, like revelation of a moment when you shared the story with me of struggling to find bras and, and, you know, because it is, they're not made with a trans woman's body in mind. And so right. Right. I would love to kind of talk about other experiences that you may have had to help to expand other people's minds at moments that we not we almost take for granted um, that, sure. you know, maybe will help to see your experience in a different light to, you know, bring more awareness to that. There's, I mean, typically <clears throat> bodies that are assigned male at birth mm -hmm. are bigger. Than, than bodies that are assigned female at birth. And my, my struggle with Victoria's Secret, I go in there, I wear a size 42 band, so, uh, so my bra, si bra band size is 42. It's close enough. <laughs> They'll figure it out, and you know, I'll edit it in post-production. But So we have a 42-inch band size, and like Victoria's Secret, like you're lucky to find a 38. Mm -hmm. You know, you've never looked for one because you have like 32-inch <laughs> band size. But... <laughs> Good eye. <laughs> <laughs> but but I go in there and I'm looking around. And I'm just like, oh gosh, yeah, I may as well leave. You know, there's there's nothing for me here. And that was mm, a couple months ago, something like that. Well, probably three four months ago. And I've, for what it's worth, you know, I don't I don't know how I want to put this, but I have developed a significant amount between. July 7th, 2022, and whatever I, whenever I went into Victoria's Secret, mm -hmm. you know, my, my, I've grown breasts and I've, you know, my, you know, fat has been redistributed so that I'm bigger on, in the hips and butt and, you know, mm -hmm. anyway, so I've, I've gotten a more womanly shape, but early on in the process, I know I wanted to look at dresses and, and even if I wore, cause I, now I tend to wear like an 18, like a size 18, you also don't understand that because you're wearing like what a two, four. So <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I'd walk into, <laughs> I'd walk into um, like Kohl's. I would go. Remember going to just a plain old department store, and mm -hmm. I'm looking at things and just going like I can't even find my size. And then when I did, I would go into the. I went into a dressing room, which by the way, I would like very carefully check. Is there anybody around? If I go at like ten in the morning, usually there aren't people trying on dresses, you know, because I didn't want to bring a dress into a man's dressing room, mm -hmm. but I wanted to be very cognizant of going into the ladies' dressing room before I was presenting very obviously as feminine because this was actually part of the process. It's hard mm. to present as a woman when you can't even get women's clothes, when you can't, you know, when you feel uncomfortable getting makeup, etc. Anyway, to finish this story, I'd walk in, I'd put on the dress, and I would go, no, just no. Even if it fit, it just, it didn't fit well. Mm. And there's, I mean, I learned sooner or later. There are certain dress styles that work for my body shape, especially as it was developing and, and now that I've gotten more or less to a stable area. There are different fashions that work well for me and different fashions that I go, yeah, avoid those. So I think that's one of the the major obstacles but it but for what it's worth like what i just described was probably the exact same scenario you had you were as you were developing going through puberty you went into department stores and went wow this dress looks like hell on me and well i think so, sorry to cut you off hmm. I, but what I, what I heard in that i mean i heard so many things and it's god i feel like i almost heard like a, you're damned if you do damned if you don't from the sense of the 
you know, to your point, you're trying to be mindful and it feels like you're walking on eggshells, which must be so hard already as you're going through this transition and you yourself, mm -hmm. I'm sure are like in like, it's, it's kind of like going through puberty all over again. It almost sounds like, you know, but you have the added judgment and potential, yes. like, um, like, uh, resistance from society or like, you know, if you had yeah. gone at the wrong time, what does that altercation look like? Right. So it's like, right. that feels really, really difficult to manage. But at the same time, it's not like you're being helped by what's available because the things that you would need in order to make society more comfortable with who you are, which like, why, right. why is that burden on you? But that's a whole other topic, right? that's not even available to you. So then as you're trying to do this, you're being, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm trying, Hey yeah. guys, I'm trying to appease to the standards that you have, but these things are not available. And then as I'm doing it, you're beating me up, you know, um, right. or not doing it right. So it, it's just, it feels like a lot of burden is placed on the transgender woman, but what sort of like, um, ownership is being taken by the people who are, you know, creating clothes or whatever, right. the bras, the, you know, intimates, the swimsuits, right. all of the things to help support that. Right. Um, so that's, that feels really intense. And then the other thing that sort of came up in all of that for me is that part of, you know, when you mentioned I have a more womanly shape and what came into my mind, I mean, that is true, you know, obviously, you know, or, you know, uh, females or people who are born female at birth may have a different body than someone who is born male at birth, right? Obviously, right. we know that, but there's also a truth to be said that I'm sure, and this goes, you know, for, for, you know, the range of body sizes, there's women out there who don't have super curvaceous bodies. And wouldn't it be so right. much more helpful in being able to assimilate to our bodies if there wasn't, you know, if you had put on a dress and it was totally okay because society didn't have a standard that you need to have, you know, boobs and an ass in order to look womanly in a dress because right. there's many women, right. you know, who don't necessarily have those attributes. And then For that's sure. why we have so many of us, you know, getting implants or doing this, this and that versus just saying, Hey, it's okay if I'm more flat chested and this is the way that my body is, I'm just leaner. And I was born this way. And it, that can still be you know, feminine and womanly. Right? right. So it's like right. so many things that are working. I don't want to say like against, but that make it more challenging. Right. And I think that, as you mentioned, there are some parallels and like our different, like coming into womanhood, you know, you know, for both of us. Um, but then it also seems like there's additional of those hurdles that you're battling with the judgment yeah. and the potential yeah. altercations that may come up. And, and there's also, there's one more point I wanted to make around that, but the, there is an additional, there is judgment by society, <clears throat> first of all, and I'm worried about, you know, offending other people, or at least I was. I tend to pass mm -hmm. fairly well now. But um, not only is there, you know, a sense of judgment that's coming externally, you know, mm -hmm. there might be a judgment that, or that somebody would go, well, you know, you're weird for, for doing this transition at all, even if they would allow me to go into, allow me to go into the women's um, dressing room, there is a, almost all of us, every transgender person, I don't even want to say woman, mm -hmm. typically we have this internal, this internalized transphobia because we have an internal shame. Those, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not mm -hmm. supposed to do this. And mm -hmm. I've, I've overcome this as much as I can, but when somebody looks at you, you know, you're going toward a dressing room and somebody looks at you and goes, oh, Jesus, you know, here comes one of those. Okay, come on, Madge, let's go. You know, you're like, yeah, never mind. Because I had too much shame already. I took so much just to get to the door. You know, yeah. if, you, if you've that. started the job, you know, by shaming me, I will finish the job, you know. Mm -hmm. So... The other thing I wanted to bring up, too, transgender men don't have it any easier. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, because most transgender men are smaller framed. And testosterone therapy, you know, will help them develop maybe even bigger, you know, uh, more barrel chests, although they might have to get breasts removed. You know, it'll probably lower their, their larynx so they get, you know, a different, a different, uh, pitch and resonance in their voice, but for the most part, clothes are terrible for them because they might have curves that men would not, mm. and particularly at the beginning. So it's the same thing. They're like, well, I'm trying to dress masculine, but I just can't because hips don't work very well with men men's clothing. Mm -hmm. 
which I've known my whole life, by the way, because I've always had sort of thick hips. And any time I've gone to get pants, I'm always like, Jesus, I can't, I can't find pants. You know. in the trunk. <laughs> yeah. And part of me, like part of me always went, you know what? I don't care. You know, it's sort of like my mother-in-law calling, you know, referring to me as she. And I went, <laughs> you know, part of me went, ooh, I can't even wear men's pants. Maybe I should go over to the department over there. You know, my mom was like, no, no. I can't. <laughs> Put on, we'll just get a bigger pair of pants, you know. So, but it's a similar thing, like it's something to get over your, like, I don't know if you've ever put on like men's pants, but like to get it over your hips, you end up with a, uh, the waistband is huge. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. so, you know, sooner or later I found out you could wear a belt who mm-hmm. knew. And so I wore a belt on, you know, my whole life. But, uh, anyway, it's no easier for transgender men. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? No. And I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, it's interesting because I feel like the point that you made about the internal shame and, 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 and the reason I keep recapping is because I'm hoping that like what we can do is like pull out these beautiful nuggets and oh, then sure. relate it back to like, for like, for example, a cisgender experience, like we have shame around, so back to my example, like I had shame around having hair on my yeah. body that felt unsightly for a lady. And, you know, and so it's kind of like, you know, you hold this shame and that like shame is one of the hardest emotions for us as humans to like relate to it and is. work through. And it is, it, it affects yeah. so much of how we show up. And so I think to be able to put that, you know, think of moments in which you want to be your most authentic self that requires so much courage and then to have an added layer of shame that is that is for whatever reason societally acceptable to make public because that's how people mm-hmm. act right they're like Ugh, you know and, and they don't hide it the way they might in other situations right, right. That is must be so difficult to stick to your intention and follow through with the actions that you need to do in order to feel in your authentic self. Mm-hmm. Like, wow. I would be willing to bet that the internal sense of shame prevents, I mean, I'm going to make up a figure. Who knows? But I'll bet you prevents as many as one out of two transgender people from taking any action whatsoever mm. because we're told we're wrong. In yeah. fact, we're told that, you know, God's going to smite us and we're going to go to, mm-hmm. you know, some eternal damnation and yeah so it makes most of us go god never mind you know yeah. like yeah. that's that's not worth it and and i'll tell you now two years in it is indeed worth it i mean there is nothing like going and looking in the mirror now and recognizing the person i see because mm-hmm. most of my life i'd go to the mirror and i go i don't know it's like a guy i don't know Mm-hmm. And it didn't make a difference. You know, I didn't want to look at in the mirror. I didn't want to look at photographs. The only other time that I had a sense of feeling right was when I was extremely androgynous in graduate school and when I dressed up in ladies' clothing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, I, I would be willing to bet that as many as one out of two transgender yeah. people will never make any movement whatsoever in transition or expressing who they are out of fear of being shamed by the rest of society. It's, it's a very difficult place to be. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, I think like that authentic expression of self is what we're all longing. Um, and for that to be okay. Um, so then taking that into, um, I guess, when we look at like marketing and advertising, you know, um, I think that there are brands that are looking to make, you know, headway in this area and being representative and inclusive. Um, that being said, you know, even when it comes to just representing, you know, cisgender women, we see a lot of tokenism, a lot of stereotyping. And so I can only imagine the same applies for transgender women. And I'd love to kind of talk about that a little bit in, from your point of view, what would make sure that the representation that's available to us in marketing and advertising doesn't feel like token, you know, tokenism, and it doesn't feel stereotypical, but actually authentic um, to what transgender women may want to see out there. You know, I wish I'm, I'm going to prattle a bit here. I don't think I have a definitive answer. Like, I wish okay. I did. 
you and I spoke about representation and marketing, and then I had a conversation with another another person about um, representation in fiction. And then I had another conversation. Now I forget what that was representation in, and. All three of those questions, or all three of those conversations, I was like, "Well, how do you prevent this idea of, of tokens?" Because when I see, when I've seen transgender women stuck into whatever, and I'm, I understand there are people attempting to be inclusive, and even succeeding in certain places, and I'm using the term "stuck into," and maybe it sounds a little pejorative. But I, I'm using that because generally if you're going to be inclusive, you want to make it really goddamn clear you're being inclusive. Mm -hmm. Like that's what marketing is kind of about. They want, there's like, there's got to be this big mallet over the head, you know, the wooden mallet over the head. And by the look, by the way, look, we have a transgender woman here. And did you yeah. see, we have a black woman and then we have an Asian woman. We have a Latina, you know, mm -hmm. and you go, okay, all right, all right. I mean... I got it. But that means you have transgender women who generally don't look as womenly as other transgender women might look. And, you know, some of my, you know, transgender brothers and sisters are, are never going to pass, mm -hmm. you know. And we, I mean, that's painful no matter who you are. Um, it's painful not to not to live up to social expectations. It's doubly painful, like I said, when, when you have already this internalized shame that you should not have the desire to, to live up to other social expectations. So how do you prevent tokenism? Um, I, what I love is there have been groups of women, like I've seen pictures online like I, you know you go into um maybe getty images i mean if you're looking for for just stock images you put in you know transgender women there have been times i've seen photographs and i'm like i i don't know that i believe these are transgender women but i've got really because i don't maybe and like i would love for the representation not to be visibly representation but mm -hmm. rather you know you you end up learning oh well there's this model and she's transgender mm. and then you go look there's that model you know and yeah. you don't go there's that transgender model but you go well there's that model i remember her you know yeah. um for the life of me i'm not remembering her name there was a um oh gosh she was like a thai miss miss thailand maybe even okay but has gone on. She wrote a book as well. And I really should remember this because my friend Tucker Lieberman wrote an article published on gender identity today. You'd think I'd remember these things, <laughs> but, but she is beautiful and she is just a model. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, at some point she was outed, outed. I'm going to stick that in quotes as transgender. And she said, yeah, in fact, she said, fuck yeah, <laughs> I am transgender. Are you kidding me? And look at how beautiful I am. And I think the perception, how she was perceived in public, changed. You know, pe people went, God, what a gorgeous woman. Wait, she's transgender? Oh, kind of creepy, though. You know. Mm. So I would love to see representation that didn't have to be, rep you know, representation I, I don't know how better to say that no no no. I, I think I mean I think you know like def, almost like you know when people say like she's a woman doctor it's like no she's a doctor you know a and, doctor. And it, yeah. yeah it's like don't because it almost sounds like you're minimizing someone's accomplishment by yes. adding this like you know uh categorization let's say right because of what qualification people yeah. yes yeah the qualification yeah um and it's and it's usually i feel like it all falls from like you know caucasian white man and then any other classification other than that is like to take you down a peg versus mm -hmm. just embracing like this is a model point blank period right you know? right yeah in, yeah in some ways now i now, I understand because now I've read a ton about this because like Ursula K. Le Guin, um, mm -hmm. I mean, Ursula is a feminine name, but oftentimes she's uh, 
I'm not coming up with the, the title she was given, but like the queen of the, the queen of, of, uh, of fantasy writing, something like that. I'm butchering that. But it, I remember somebody wrote an article and said, well, this is ridiculous. Like, why do we have to say queen? Or why do we have to say mistress? You know, can't we just say a really goddamn good writer? Mm-hmm. And I, I get that in some ways we want like we want to add these qualifications we want we want to say not just a doctor but a woman at the same time because it's supposed to imply which means she had a much harder time getting into school getting through school passing all these exams you know being thought of as legitimate this is a bigger accomplishment than you might think but then it tends to diminish the accomplishment that it's trying to to glorify so it I feel again we're in almost sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't yeah. situation. I so I hear you because I totally agree as well. Like to be able to acknowledge, um, you know, for example, just say, you know, um, if there was to be a super successful like Latina founded business, it's worthwhile to mention that the founder is Latina because it's so right. much like, you know, the, the funding behind there, the number of like businesses that fail, you know, it, and you're just looking at all the numbers, um, I think. Is imp- it does paint a more holistic picture. So I agree with you. That it's just, it feels like a double-edged sword. Yeah, yeah. Sure. You know, calling out the difficulty of the accomplishment is is great. But, yeah. but making it be just a label is not. So. Yes, yes. Ooh, yes. Um, okay, so then I guess, like, if we were trying to make it a little bit more tangible to understand what might feel stereotypical when looking to, you know, have trans women or just trans people as a part of, like, let's say, like, the talent for a campaign, what are some things that brands could maybe look out for that might be, like, faux pas? Shoot, I'm a little bit on the spot for that. Um... I'm going to I'm going to diverge from the t- from the question just a touch. The, there are campaigns that I've seen that I think are intended to be targeted toward toward women and then oftentimes I'll see pictures of people who are probably more non- non-binary or gender fluid in like I said in the name of of appearing inclusive without necessarily, you know, being inclusive. And so there will be, there have been photographs I've seen of, of um, a person, and I'll, I'll tell you, I have no idea what this person's gender identity is, but it's somebody in, a, in say, feminine clothing with some facial hair. Mm-hmm. And I'll go, cool. I mean, I'm glad that, I'm glad that, that this person is, is getting work. I'm glad that we're including this person. And if you have a campaign that's supposed to be targeted toward femininity mm. like to me anyway i see that and i go is this I mean, this is me and i'm not saying this is necessarily the way all of us should think but i see something like that and i go is that how the world sees me mm. like mona lisa with a mustache i i don't interesting interesting that that's so, a really good food for thought there of like the how how the self-concept is internalizing what's being put out there if it's being yeah. you know yeah. te- if it's targeting like right. femininity or a female right. demographic female identifying demographic yeah cuz it like something just hit sort of hit home in my mind like at the end of the day i don't i'm going to say this and i'll be crucified but like i don't necessarily want representation like i just want to be shown here look this is what looks feminine you know this is what women today do because today i am a woman and i do things and and so you know like i don't need to go oh gosh and plus this is what a transgender woman can do too you know i don't need that i just when you and i spoke about representation you you mentioned latina in particular and you said um Oh, I wish I could remember how you said it, because it was so well said that when we see people similar to us doing something great, it shows us we can do those great things, too. 
<laughs> Hopefully I didn't butcher that too badly. It no, was, was such great. such an amazing quote because I went, oh, yeah, yes. I was like, I have never heard such a good description of, of representation. So for me, I don't, I mean, I call myself a transgender woman because I like the idea of somebody looking at me and going, oh, and she's transgender. I, I want that qualification because I want to make it clear that the message I'm bringing out there comes from my transgender experience. Yes. But I also, when, I, when there's marketing that's going on, like I'm part of a larger group of women. Yes. Not, yes. Okay. You know, I, I don't need it to be any more sectional. It, yeah, I, I guess that's the word I want to use. I don't need it to be any more sectional than here. here's what women do. Because I can look at that and go, I would want to do that or I would not want to do that, you know. Yeah. So I don't know if that was a good answer or not. No, it's like, it is because I think the takeaway, too, is in everything we've discussed, when we look at it like a like bird's eye view, it sounds like the inclusivity and the representation that would be most meaningful for the community would be in having the products that include the use case for yes. trans women, as opposed to right. the messaging being targeted and almost like sectioning you off from women, right? And and then yes. I will say yes. like a little asterisk of everybody's transition or presentation goal may be different, but in your particular case, you're looking, your, your transition is to assimilate in the group of women. So the messaging does not need to parse yeah. you out from everyone else. It's just more like, give yes. me what I need in order to facilitate this integration into womanhood, let's call it. That, um, yeah, that hit me hard too. When you met, when you said here's here's what representation is good for, that hit me hard pretty hard. But when you just said there, it's it's of little value to section me out further, it was mm. like yes. I don't know if you watched my my expression, but I was like, yeah, that's it exactly. I was like, that is it. I don't want mm. to be thought of as somebody different. I just want to be thought of as well. I just want to be thought of as a woman. Yeah. I don't know how oh, better to put it. It's hard to hear it back from you. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so loud and clear and that's so beautiful. And I'm so glad that we were able to clearly like distill that because then mm. it makes it very clear that it's more about looking to connect with people and serve them, which at the end of the day, any successful brand that is your goal is to be yes. of service to the people that have shown support right. to help grow your brand. And right. in understanding you know, who forms part of that demographic, if that includes trans people, then how can your product be inclusive to them and actually work for them versus make right. them feel like, oh, there must be something wrong with me or this brand is no longer for me, right? Yeah. There's, I think there is a, I mean, I think it's innocent, more or less. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there's a, a difference between what we would want to call, I'm trying to figure out how to, formulate this, which is why I'm stuttering, what we want to call inclusive and what truly feels inclusive. Mm. Because when you get into a group and you get left out of the conversation, it may be, you know, three other of your peers. You feel totally and completely included because everybody is just like you are, but you're still left out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a, um, there's a, you know, there's the famous quote. Um, of course, I'm going to forget the, 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 the person who made the quote um, that, you know, diversity is, is inviting everybody to the, is invite, inviting everybody to a dance, but inclusivity is, you know, everybody being asked to dance. I've butchered that, but. No, but, but I love that because I point. think 100%. So it's kind of what I'm hearing and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm sort of hearing as well in that is kind of like we've talked about this idea of like peacocking the inclusivity and kind of being like spamming yeah. it on your marketing. And it's like, yeah. that's the version of inviting everyone to the dance, but not asking them to dance. And then the part of asking everyone to dance is actually doing the work to expand your product line to yes. actually invite everyone to participate in the experience of the brand, not just plastering them on a marketing campaign. Is that yes. correct? Absolutely. Yes. Totally and completely correct. Cause yeah. I can't add to it. I love <laughs> so it. I oh, yay, we did it. 
Um, okay, let's take a look and see. Okay, so more and more, I feel like there have been, you know, brave trans people in particular. I follow um, Dylan, and, you know, she can be polarizing in the trans conversation. I personally yeah. love hyper femininity and, um, you know, but I, I, I can understand and respect that people have different ideas and opinions because they feel like that it may be mm, not representative of the challenges, which I think that it's only one slice of what's being shown. So I guess with that being said, I guess this is a two part question. Um, and we can choose to keep or cut this, but like, I would love to hear you. Uh, mm, okay. I, okay. This is a better way to put the question. One of the thoughts in sort of like, like I said, the polarizing aspect of Dylan is that some people feel that it's glorifying certain aspects of the stereotypical way to express as a woman um, yeah. that's very like monolithic and it looks one way. Um, that being said, she is only one woman and she can only represent one identity, which is her authenticity. Of so yeah. I guess the question there is, um, do you feel as a trans woman that, um, I guess, uh, let me figure out how I can put this. I guess the question is sort of like, I, I'll preface this by saying, I don't believe this to be true. And I believe that if you're choosing to be a woman, I think that you, and you've also experienced society like in a male presenting body I think you've seen both sides and I think you understand if you cho like not chosen but like if you've gone and through this step of judgment and transitioned I don't think it's without knowing the challenges that women face and so I don't feel that it's fair to say that just because you choose to present in a hyper feminine way you're completely out of touch with the challenges that women have been fighting for years I to me that I don't understand that argument so I would just love to hear sort of I guess your thoughts on that I'm gonna agree with you up front just say I agree I mean each of us each of us faces challenges. And I, you know, I have, I have several friends who, who are very, I don't know if I want to say very fond, but the way that they refer to before, like pre-transition, it was their period of, of male privilege. Mm. And now they're in their period of, of female oppression. Mm. You know, they, they talk of it as you know, having transition, but I, but I believe, you know, you, I believe the intent is to say that if you are male, you have all of these privileges that you've now lost. And, uh, <clears throat> and I don't disagree with that because obviously there are privileges men enjoy, particularly white men enjoy, that, that women do not. And I'm not debating that. I don't think that it'd be possible to debate that. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, like there's a lot of challenge each of us faces challenge. And I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to, to try to determine where all your challenges came from. Mm. While I was engaged in my male privilege, let's say, when I was a manager, I did great at managing down. I did terrible at managing up because I was operating in a very, what I would consider a very feminine way. And it was great for the people I needed to nurture and the people I needed to grow and for a team that needed to, to be, you know, to do whatever it needed to do. But then when I had like alpha males above me, they were kind of like, well, we can just eat her up, you know, mm -hmm. we can just, just tear, tear this person apart. So, so did I experience full male privilege? I would kind of say no. I think all I experienced was, you know, amethyst of privilege, whatever it might have been, across my entire life. Um, your question was not really about that. You know, your, your question is more about, it, to my mind, I mean, it's the, the idea of what, like if I were to distill it again, like the question is, how come we can't just be who we are at the day, the, the day that we are that person? Mm -hmm. 
And I guess I kind of go, yeah, why not? You know, Dylan Mulvaney, I got to tell you, I, you know, I first saw Dylan and I was like, oh, geez. You know, because I'm like, here's another represent, uh, representation of a really flamboyant, you know, person who's calling herself now transgender. And I thought, ugh, this is not good. It's not good for the, it's not good for the brand, you know, as it were. And the more that I've gone through it, because like you can now say, well, Dylan is not good for the transgender brain. But I mean, wow, everything she's been through, like people shooting bullets through cans of beer that don't even have her picture on it because there was one can that had. I do not think that that's, you know, an OK experience. That's a challenge that probably she goes to bed every night and goes, I hope I wake up in the morning that there's not somebody who's going to put a bullet through me like they put a bullet through a beer can. Yeah. So why can't we just be the person we are at every point that we are that person? I don't know. Yeah. I love looking feminine. I put makeup on for you. I put little lip gloss on, you know, dye in my hair. You know, this is natural, right? So. Yes, of course. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I do a lot of things to look feminine. I'm wearing a skirt. I'm not going to stand up for the for the audience, but you know, I do things to be feminine because I like being feminine. And Dylan does what she does because she likes it. You know, good. You do. I mean, you know, I made I made mention. Somebody said, "Hey, the last time you and I talked, somebody said, hey, how did the the conversation with Danny go?'" And I said, "Oh my God, the whole time she's like, you know." <laughs> Her hair is so beautiful. It's like, you know, you do the things you do because you like them, you know. 100%. I love Good. that. I'm glad you do. So I love that because, sorry. No, no, no. I think I'm finished because I don't know where else I would go with it. It's like, we are, we are who we are. And because it's authentic just to it. Let it I, be. Yeah. I love that so much because, God, I, what I love in today's conversation is that in every point that we've made that we think is a conversation that we're having about trans people, it is just people. Because I yes. think it's so true when people, for example, like I've seen these like TikToks that are going around and it's like, I'm not a feminist because I can cook. I'm not a feminist because <laughs> I let a man help me. And I'm just right? like, that's not what feminism is. No. And it just, I feel like it's like putting people in box because you're right. Like I love being hyper feminine and actually, you know, womankind creative, we talked about in our last conversation, how it allowed me to kind of like unhide. But part of it is it also allowed me to yes. reclaim this hyper feminine part of myself I love getting my like you know my hair and it's so long and I love it and my nails are always done I love doing makeup and it's not because I'm looking for male validation or to uphold any sort of standard it's because I feel like my most happiest and I enjoy it it's not a chore to do these things it's fun for me you know and yes. I think like what I'm, what I'm hearing you say it's the same exact thing it's like for you it, for all trans people it is an individual decision that individuals are making about what is their self-concept and what is authentic yes. to them. And for Dylan, this is her authenticity. And to question mm -hmm. that is fucked. Just like I would never question an, a cis woman. I would never question a man and ask him why he's wearing those trans trousers. Like, why right. do I feel that it's okay to question someone else on what their self-expression is? And that kind of right. just seems like that's it. You know, you don't. <laughs> I, I think it is. Because, I mean, we can look at many cisgender women and go, well, why are you too fat? Uh, oh, Tilda Swinton. There we go. Tilda Swinton, who played the uh, the White Witch and the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe forever ago. <laughs> she, to my knowledge, and, and perhaps I'm wrong, but Tilda Swinton, to my knowledge, is cisgender, fairly masculine looking, and leans into it. You know, I've seen um, magazine spreads of, of her where she is, like wearing a suit and stuff and i go mm -hmm. go tilda like go you i've seen the same of kate blanchett whom i also believe is pretty dang feminine you know but people go eh, why is kate blanchett looking so masculine well because if that's what kate blanchett wants to look like fucking let kate blanchett do what kate blanchett wants to do same yes. with tilda swinton everybody you know yeah I, the the police mentality that I think has grown up in the last, I don't know, 20 years? 
you know, because I feel like when I was, there were times I was dressed up in Georgia, in Georgia, small town Georgia. My car broke down once, actually. I was driving home from Atlanta and my car broke down and somebody came and picked me up and I was like, had the hood up and I was like bending over, you know, looking into the, the car like I had any idea what the hell to do because I didn't. I was just like, I don't know, maybe I see something and it makes sense. My car just stopped. Who the hell knows? But I'm wearing like a short, tight velvet skirt and, uh, you know, thigh high stockings and stuff. I probably have these 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 brocade um, heels that I used to love. I love those. Anyway, I'm dressed up. Some dude picked me up and says, do, you know, good old boy type guy and goes, do you need a ride home? You know, can, and that way you can figure out your car later. And I was like, I am going to be killed. And I thought to myself, you know what? Maybe I'm not. Cause, and if I'm not, great, because I don't know how else to get home, and I'm a good 10 miles, so I'm not going to walk in these heels. So I said, yeah, take me home. And the guy did. Nothing happened. He didn't. There was no, like, nothing else happened. And I, you know, I got home, and I just thought, well, maybe people don't care. Mm -hmm. And now people do. Like, why? Why? I don't know. Um, I feel like I had a better you know, message that I wanted to say there, uh, other than it seems like we've built up this police mentality over the course of whatever, 20, 25 years, that, well, it's almost 30 years, but where we go, I've got to care what you're doing. I've just got to care. Do you think that that's due to social media? I am gonna, I'm gonna take the guess no. And I, I'm taking the guess no because I think, well, you know what, that might be a contributing factor. What I was gonna say is I feel like the, as, I feel like people have, have, have wanted to become more fundamentalist in all of their thought, not, you know, there are fundamentalist Christians, certainly, but I have seen, you know, a gay population. I mean, I even experienced this. I, I remember going to like a party, like a gay party. And I was telling somebody, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm bisexual. And the person was like, what? Oh, get the fuck away from me. And I'm like, wait a minute. It was like, a, it's a fundamentalism in that thought that if you're going to be gay, be gay. If you're going to be straight, be straight. But I was in the middle, and, and even a gay man was like, what? I don't even get it. Why would you do that? Why can you not make a decision? I remember that question. Why can't you just make a decision? And I'm like, because I don't want to. Why would you have this fundamentalist thought? So does it come from social media? I, I, believe, I believe social media could have contributed to, because we're exposed to so many things, we can respond to more of them, right? Because, I mean, if you, like, you know, growing up in Los Angeles, I got a lot of experiences. But if I grew up in, say, Dubuque, Iowa, and, and somebody, you know, there was somebody who was, say, a, you know, a white male who dressed up in a skirt, maybe I'd go, eh, everybody else I know is white and male. This person's got a skirt, but, like, that's still two out of three, and that's not bad. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe there's less... Uh, rejection of that idea because it's like, well, you still meet most of what I expect. But if you're going to get like somebody who is Thai, who has gone through an entire gender transition and, uh, you know, is dancing at a festival and you're from Dubuque, Iowa, you go, yeah, nothing there computes. I see no white. I see no hat. I see no, you know, I gone through surgery, just like, you know, doesn't compute. So, Maybe, maybe the internet, internet has contributed, but I'm really kind of spitballing. I, mm -hmm. I wish I knew. Yeah. That's fair. So I think um, the other point that I like that you made with regards to your experience, but also Dylan's, right? I mean, we don't know her lived experience, you know, sure. prior and post. I mean, we only see what's in social media and even that's filtered. So I guess, though, what I liked in that takeaway is 
these comments that seem to somehow try and minimize her experience as a woman by saying, well, you could never know the challenges of a woman feel so like lost and dumbfounded because she had her own challenges. Even even prior to the transition, they looked different potentially than than a than a you know cis het woman. But she had different. her challenges, and then even mm-hmm. after transitioning, she's continued to have you know not only probably woman associated problems, but also her own because of the transition. Right. So they're still unique. And so the takeaway there is that, and it kind of comes back to I had a question on inter- uh, intersectionality, and I think that that's it. Is like we can't ever one be comparing traumas and being like well my story is harder than your story because it's true to you and it was traumatic to you period there's no debating that and for all of us all of our challenges are going to be so singularly nuanced because of the intersections at which all of our you know our our being exists right so it's like it's neither here nor there to try and disqualify or minimize her being a woman by just saying like you would never know because you're not you weren't born a woman like to me that's I think we've debunked that so hard and the (laughs) takeaway is we are all just individuals who have our own lived experiences and we'd be so much better off if we weren't trying to put people into these standards of whether it's beauty or gender um, and and or or the sexuality as, as the story that you mentioned and just being able to accept the snapshot of the person that is in front of us yeah. And that's it. <laughs> and release yeah. the rest. This is just a person. And, you know, this is how they present in whatever right. area that is. Right. I want to throw one quick monkey wrench into cool. that. Okay. Because, okay. Now, <laughs> because I think, because I think it's beautiful. And then if you were to look at me, like, how am I trying to label myself? Mm-hmm. I mean, you can look at me now. I'm clearly presenting feminine, right? I want yes. to be lumped into a box of women. I, you know, <laughs> that came out weird, but I want to be lumped in <laughs> you know, to the label woman. Yeah. I also want to, you know, want to adopt labels. It's easy. I, I think it's easy for us to have a certain shorthand and just say, well, this, this is me. You know, I want to be known as transgender woman. And if you go, well, that's, you know, not saying a lot of who you are. True. But I'm still adopting a label. Um, So, yes, Mm -hmm. I want everybody to to after I've adopted that label and told you that label to say, well, tell me more because that doesn't like that tells me nothing, you know. But I, I will also say that I think labels are kind of a a normal part of the human experience as well, just because we we need ways of describing who we are that don't take, you know, an hour. Totally story. <laughs> right, right. Do we, do we need more than those labels? Because like in social media, if you can just go, well, I don't know, I see, you know, a transgender woman, like I don't need to know the whole story. Because I'm never going to meet this person. If I'm going on a date with that person, yeah, maybe I'd like to know more. But so I guess that's the point is, you know, you need to know everybody's life story prior to being able to to make any comments about mm. trauma, lived experience. And then at the same time, if you go, well, I don't have that information. OK, then don't judge, you know, don't yeah. don't make any assumptions about lived experience when all you have are labels. So. Ooh, I love that. That that was beautiful. No, I love (laughs) that. And I think if we bring that back to like marketing and advertising, I think it's like the takeaway there is like, go beyond the label always, Mm -hmm. you know, cause, cause if this is your target market, if these are people who you're interested in, who you should be because they're interested in you. Right. Uh, Right. and so it's like, do the due diligence of not just saying this is a Latina woman, this is a transgender woman. And as a blanket statement, all these people like this, it's like, no, in our particular segment of people who show up for our brand, who are interested in this lifestyle and these products, This is what matters to this little section of people that we've gotten to know. That doesn't mean right. it applies across the board. And we can just, right. like, generalize this. Um, so do your homework. <laughs> right. Do your homework. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? We, we missed out on, like, two-thirds of these questions. I, 
I apologize. <laughs> no, no. I think I think we hit them in different ways. Okay. I think we did. Yes. Did did you get did you get what you were hoping for? I think I think we did. Honestly, I think that the end goal is just to have a conversation that one, not maybe not everyone is privy to having, comfortable to having, you know? I know when we met, I felt so lucky to be able to meet you and to have this bond that we have, to be able to have these very comfortable conversations that allow my own understanding and perception of the world to expand. And I just wanna be able to impart that on our community and your community across the board. And, and if this can fuel more conversations and get more feedback and people are interested in more things, I think that that is valuable. and you know, that's just the contribution I wanted to make today. So thank, thank you, you for sharing so openly and for allowing me to ask without having me feel nervous or judged or scared. Oh, no, no. You know, I, it's funny. I had a conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago, actually from the same organization where we met. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, she, I mentioned I'm transgender. I said, so you know this, right? And she goes, well, I, I didn't, but you know, Here's a really interesting story and goes on to tell me about her husband went on like a vacation, I believe, with a non-binary pansexual person and had no idea how to refer to this person, had no idea, you know, should I say something about a boyfriend? Should I say, you know, your romantic interests? You know, had no idea how to ultimately how to treat this person. And so... I, I, mean, I don't, I don't want to mess up this story, but my understanding is that he came home and said to his wife, the woman I'm talking to, was just like, I didn't even know what to ask. Like, I didn't know where to start. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the person I'm talking to says, yeah, why don't we have these conversations? Like, why don't we talk about how you refer to a non-binary person? Why don't we talk about, like, how do you get pronouns? Because in, in my head, I'm like, all you have to do is ask for, just like ask. Mm -hmm. I just have, just, you know, I, now half the time when I go to meet somebody, I go, hi, I'm Amethyst, is she, her pronouns? What are your pronouns? You know, and the person goes, hi, you know, such and such. And that's not even, I mean, it could be somebody clearly cisgender, but I go, or, you know, clearly somebody who looks comfortable in his or her gender, but I'm still going to ask because it's like, well, it's an easy, it could be 10 seconds, right? But my point is, she said, it's interesting what, that we, none of us feels comfortable to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, to me, it seems self-evident just to, just to ask. If you don't know something, you just say, I don't know. Yeah. But we don't want to do that anymore. And, and, um, and I think it's been damaging for, for our entire society. So... So I'm, I'm glad you asked to have this conversation because the more we can have and the more public they are, hopefully the more people will go, oh, hey, Amy isn't all that weird anyway. Or it's not that scary to ask questions, you know? Yeah. Even right. if you don't know how to formulate them, I feel like I, you know, I bump across them and stuff, but it's like, how else do you learn, right? Like, yeah. you don't. No, exactly. So... Well, I'll tell you what, let me, I think we are a little bit out of time. Not even a little bit. Um, <laughs> we, and then, you know, we're going to hang up. We're going to talk for an hour after this. That's the, we're going to plan <laughs> episode three anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I'll do the standard closing just to say I'm, I'm Amethyst Herrick. You're listening to Gender Identity Weekly. I'm here with Danny Velasquez Mora. More, I'm sorry. Danny Velasquez Mora. And uh, we were talking about transgender representation, which turned into just plain old human representation. So mm. thank you to the listeners. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. And uh, talk to you next week, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs>